to our program from house to house. Won't you come in and join us for a while in the Word? Please join me and the ladies as we continue on in our series that we have called Repent. Not a popular word, not a word everybody wants to hear, but it is in the Word of God and we are commanded that we need to repent. We cannot go on in life pretending that our wrongs are just okay, that God isn't paying any attention. Because his eyes are, are going to and fro, the scripture says, the Lord's eyes go to and fro throughout the earth. He's searching. There's nothing hidden from his eyes. He's observing. And so we cannot pretend that our sin is something God winks at any longer, that something God ignores. He commands that men everywhere and everyone that we come to repentance, a place of being sorry for our sin. Because when we sin, we sin against God. And the scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're listening to me today. You no doubt have had to deal with sin issues in your life. I've had to deal with mine. But thank God a provision has been made whereby our sins can be forgiven and forever gone. They can be cleansed through his precious blood. I love and cleave to that promise in 1 John where it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. One of the more uh, fantastic verses is that the fact that he says, and he would remember our sins no more against us. Isn't that awesome? So we're on the subject of repentance. We're getting near the end of this 12-part series, and today will be lesson number 11, ladies. It's amazing how fast the time goes. And today we're going to deal with the subject of who. Again, who needs to repent? Well, today we want to focus on the field of a self-centered church. Not only do the people out in the world need to repent and get right with God, but a church whose focus is upon themselves me and mine, what I'm going to receive, forgetting what others may need, a self-centered church needs to repent. I don't know what it's like in many places of the globe, but I do know that here in the West, we're very prone to be self-centered. We're often looking for our blessing, our uh, victory, what God is going to do for us, so forth and seldom spending time to think about those in the far reaches of this world that need to yet hear the gospel. I hope that the lesson today will be a challenge to not only you, but it'll be a challenge in my life even more so to do what I can do to see that men everywhere hear the gospel before the great judgment day comes. Ladies, we're grateful to have you be a part in the filming from house to house, and we also want to express our appreciation to the Bearlands, Kevin and Talitha, for making possible that we could film in their home. So we're going to turn in our Bibles now, ladies, and let's get started in the subject of a self-centered church and its need to repent. Turn to Joel. That's a little book of the prophet Joel in your Old Testament, near the latter part of that Old Testament scripture. Joel 2 Let's look at verse 1. This is God speaking through the mouth of the prophet Joel, for that's what a prophet is. It's someone who speaks on the behalf of God. He becomes just the vehicle. He becomes just the voice of God's inspired word. Here is God's command. It's a very strong one. It sounds like a, a command of urgency that something needs to be done right now. And I think this fits. Uh, and at least I know it fits the, the part of the church here in the West. But God is saying through the mouth of the prophet, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy Mount Zion. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the judgment of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. So blow the trumpet, blow the trumpet. You know, 
In the Old Testament, we would read that God had set up a method whereby the congregation of Israel would have certain signals that the trumpet would give. And there were ones that signified it was time to gather and come, as we would say today, come to church, come to the tabernacle, come and worship. There were times when they would blow the trumpet and it had a different sound, it had a different uh, signal to it, and it was that they should prepare for war. But there was also times when they would sound that trumpet and it was a sound of an alarm, an alarm, an emergency. Well, God is saying that it's time to blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm. Sound it in Mount Zion. <laughs> and the reason it needs to be sounded is to alert the people the fact that the day of judgment is coming and that it's getting closer and closer at harm. You know, in the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, as Paul wrote to the Gentile church there, he was instructing them that if the trumpet did not give a certain sound, who would prepare themselves for the battle? How would they know to get ready for battle that warfare was upon them if the trumpeter did not give the correct message with his trumpet? And so what he is saying is that those of us that are expressing the things of God, if we're not giving the proper sound, the proper message, the proper alarm for this hour, then the people are not going to be ready. But God wants his trumpet blown and his trumpeters to trump the signal that says judgment is coming and it's getting close at hand. Now, I would prefer to just always share series that are just really comforting, upbuilding and so forth. But the Lord has put this message on my heart, child of God, that we need to examine ourselves, as the scripture says. The scripture says, examine yourselves. Don't wait for someone else to examine you. Examine yourselves, the scripture says, and see if you be in the faith. In other words, are you aligning, aligning your life with the standard of God's word? God's word is the plumb line. It's what helps us to know if things are out of line, crooked, or if they're erect and straight and true. And we measure our life up against, the, the, as it were, the plumb, plumb line to see if we are lined up with the word of God. And it's time to do that, children of God. We can't live a loose, haphazard, godly life. We've got to live one drawing nigh to God, getting closer and closer to the Lord, and being conformed to the image of his own likeness. So it's time for the trumpeters, even persons as myself who God has called to sound the alarm that we need to give that kind of a signal. It's not, it's not an alarm that, that would go off like the trumpeter saying, oh, have a happy day. This is a great time. Go enjoy yourself. Be at ease in Zion. No, it's a time to sound the alarm that judgment is a sure thing. It is coming. In fact, it is close at hand. Ladies, would you turn with me now to Joel 2, verse 12 through 17. Again, the prophet speaks under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it reads, There also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Oh, yes, even today, as it was in the days when God spoke through Joel. The Spirit of God is speaking to those that have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's time for the trumpeters to blow their trumpets and to give the kind of signal that says, prepare, 
prepare, prepare, repent. If you need to get your wrongs right, get it done now. Now is the time. Don't wait. Don't delay. He says, turn to me with all your heart. God doesn't want half of your heart, half of your life. He wants your all. He gave his all and he wants your all. He wants my all. He says it's a time for fasting. So you say fasting, what's fasting? You know, it's, it's so seldom, especially here in the West, that people can be troubled to fast. But he says it's time to fast and even to weep and to mourn for what? Why? Just because we're emotional? No, because of the condition that people's lives are in. And in our own life, we need to weep, we need to mourn. We, in other words, we need to repent and see that wrong is wrong and to get our wrongs right. He says, I don't want you rending your garments or tearing your garments. Rend your heart, not your garments. People can, you know, do exterior things that look spiritual and appeasing to God, but God looks on the heart. You see, man looks on the outward appearance, ladies, but God is looking where? God looks on the heart. And so he says, rend your heart. Don't do a phony religious thing like you're, oh, tear your garments. That's what they used to do in the biblical days. If they were in uh, distress or grief or mourning, they would just rip their garments back. Well, God says, change your heart. That will be more impressive to God. So we shouldn't do things that are sacrilegious or a pretense. We need to be genuine with God because we can't fool God. We can fool ourselves, but we can't fool God. And he says, it's time for that bridegroom. Come on, bridegroom, get out of your chamber. And bride, come out of your closet. It's time for the bride and the bridegroom to be revealed. Yes, this was literal. And it was historical. But spiritually, there's a message for us today, believer. It's time for the bridegroom to be revealed and to be exposed to the eyes of the nations that he come out of his chamber, that we show forth Jesus for who he really is according to the word, not as we would like to paint him or we would like to portray him or we would like to doctor him up and make him look this way and make him up in a sense so that he comes across the way we want people to perceive him. No, in alignment with the word of God, the bridegroom needs to come out of the chamber and be seen for who he is is because it won't be long before man will see him face to face the scripture says every eye shall see him and behold him when he comes and so it's time for us to seek the face of God that especially when the unbeliever encounters the presence of the believer and the church especially that they will see the bridegroom has come out of his chamber and they can see the Lord and you know when people see the Lord high and lifted up for who he really is, it's amazing how their hearts melt in his presence. It has to be a very, very hardened heart that is not touched by the presence of the visitation of the Lord himself. Not only should the bridegroom come out of his chamber, but it's time to call the bride out of her closet. And you say, what are you talking about, Carol? That sounds rather strange. Well, to me, that speaks of her prayer closet. Because in Matthew 6, verse 6, we won't turn there, ladies, but you're probably familiar when Jesus taught and he said to the individuals, he said that you should go in your closet and pray in secret to your father in secret. And then when you come out of your prayer closet, he said the father will re reward you openly what you've been talking to him about in your secret prayer closet. Now, you don't have to have a literal closet that you go into in order to pray. Your closet may be your car as you're driving along. Your closet may be your bedroom, some certain place, a place where you meet with God, a place where you communicate with God, just you and God alone. And in secret, the scripture says, what you pray there and talk to the Father is a secret between you and him. Then when God answers that and you go out away from your closet, and you come out and deal with everyday life and face the public in your world, then God's going to honor that time you spend in the closet of prayer with him and he will reward that time and dedication openly and others will see the answers to those prayers you prayed in secret and it's time for the bride to be busy in the closet of prayer I wondered in the church that you attend how much time is dedicated among that body of believers 
in prayer, whether it's in their church actually or in their own private lives. How much time is spent in communication, uninterrupted even, in the presence of the Holy One of Heaven? It's when we've spent time with God that when we come out and have to deal with the affairs of our life, that is when it is manifested. God's honoring that time with him. You know, it says of Jesus how that even as he sought the Father and prayed when he walked this earth, when he would draw himself apart and pray and talk with the Father, it says that his very, his very uh, presence his countenance would be altered. It would be changed. The effect of having been in the presence of the Father. You and I, when we spend time in sincerity, secretly alone, not to be seen of man, but in the presence of the Father in a closet of prayer, when we come out, others can see that there's a change in us. You know, sometimes it's good, little sister in Christ, especially if there's great needs in your home, that when you have an opportunity to spend time alone with God so that when your children come home from school or come into the house, they sense the presence of the Lord and they know. They don't have to ask and say, Mama, have you been in prayer? They know. They can tell by the spirit and the presence, the attitude, that's the fragrance of Jesus, that Mama has been with Jesus. When the husband comes home from work tired and he's had a hassling day, he can sense that presence welcoming him, the presence of that the wife has spent with her heavenly father. Now, you can't do that all day long and not take care of your household. That's not what I'm suggesting. Vice versa, when we spend time with God in our prayer closet, it has a bearing and an effect that others reap the benefit of. It should definitely make a difference in us, especially our attitudes and the manner with which we serve others. You know, it says, he that would be chief, he must be servant of all. And Jesus displayed it by Billy being willing to get down and even wash the disciples' feet. And they were offended that he would stoop so low. But he was teaching them a, symbol, a, a symbolic message of how that uh, we need to be willing to have a servant's heart. And your family, the people you know, the people you relate to closely, they know if you have been with the Lord because it will cause you to have, like him, a servant's heart. So it's time for the bride to come out of her closet and for her to be revealed and the bridegroom to be revealed. Yes, because it isn't that far away when the marriage supper of the Lamb, the, there will be that precious uniting of the bride and the groom. And I'm talking about Jesus Christ, who he gave his life for us and bought us with a dear price and his people, his church, the blood washed saints, they will be united with him as his bride indeed to rule and reign with him through all eternity. Oh, what an awesome thought, ladies, that which God has prepared for those that love him and seek him. Now, if you're listening to me today and you don't hardly understand what I'm talking about and it sounds like gibberish to you, I want to simply put it this way. You can participate with us in the faith according to God's word. And if you will call upon the name of the Lord, the scripture says, everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Call upon him. Ask him to be your savior. Ask him to be the, the Lord of your life and get into his word and begin to learn how to relate to God and how God thinks and align your life with his thinking, not your thinking. And ask the Lord to give you newness of life and to grow in him. And you will find that you will be very much a part of this company. You don't have to have a great uh, pedigree, let's say, a great heritage. You don't have to be somebody to be important to God or be a part of the kingdom of God. It'll be made up of the highs and the lows in the eyes of man, but in the eyes of God, there's no respect to person. So whosoever will may come. And as I said before, it is made so simple. The entrance is so simple because Jesus said, I'm the door. You've got to come through his name, come through his substitute for us at Calvary. It is so simple that even a child can enter therein. And so there's no excuse for you, my friend. Don't tarry on the outside, but enter in. Yes, it's time for even, the scripture here says, for the ministers, the priests, that they should weep between the porch and the altar. There at the temple pattern, they would come to the porch, and then they would come in the entrance. They would enter on in. 
At the, at the latter end would be the altar where the priests ministered with the various ves, um, uh, vessels and instruments. But it, the scripture here is saying it's time of such alarm that it's time for those priests, the ministers, to weep. In other words, to bring with a spirit of repentance, not only for their own life and household, but for the sake of the congregation, for the sake of the, of the public at large. It's time for us to have a spirit of repentance before God. You know, it's when you think that you're just perfect, you do everything right, that is when you're headed for a fall, my friend. The scripture says, he that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he should fall. When you think that you are just so above all the rest, high and mighty in God, watch out, watch out. You're headed for a destructive fall. Be careful, be careful. But we need to take inventory in our life. Yes, we don't make ourselves a rug and say, oh, I'm so unworthy. I won't believe, but no, we do need to take inventory and let the Holy Spirit deal in our life. And if there's things we need to repent of, we need to do that. We need to do that. In Revelation, ladies, I'm going to ask you to turn there now quickly, way over to the last part of your scriptures. In chapter 3, verse 14 through 19, we're going to read that. And it is where God deals with the Laodicean church and this is the last church of the seven that he describes and he's calling all of them basically to repentance yes they were churches that professed the lord but they came to a state and they came some of them to a stalemate where they needed to renew their vows with god they needed to renew their relationship to god now the church of laodicea it because it was very wealthy you know, with pompous and power and popularity and so forth, it, it didn't think it needed to repent. It thought it was quite okay. But the Lord had a lot against that church, and it is a symbolic uh, example of perhaps the church of our generation, ladies. I hate to admit it, but it seems to have a description of the church at whole, as a whole of our generation. In Laodicea, that particular town. It was a city that was a wealthy center of trade and commerce. This was not a poor little pitiful little group of people, a simple little flock. This was a collection of people who had professed Christ that came from an area that was very wealthy, where there was a center of trade and commerce. Laodicea is also known as a banking center. It was famous for its medical school. But you know what happened? It stood in such arrogance and pride when the Lord dealt with it <coughs> that it came to ruin. It came to ruin. So this is the scriptures, ladies. And it says, Unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and write white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyesab that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. So he's calling this church, Laodicean, to repentance. They were lukewarm. They weren't hot or cold for God. They were boastful and thinking they're, well, they're wealthy. They don't need anything. But he says, you need some white raiment. You need to get your garments washed again, in other words. He says, therefore, you need to repent. Oh, Laodicea, the church there became nothing but ruins, and to this day, it lies in much of its ruins. I would like to share with you, ladies, in Lamentations 5, verse 16 through 21, a prayer of renewal, a prayer of repentance that I think would be very fitting for us to pray today as Jeremiah prayed in the spirit for the people of his day, the professed people of God. It says, the crown has fallen from our head. This is Lamentations 5, 16 through 21. 
Our honor is brought to the dust. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint and sick. Because of these things, our eyes are dim and see darkly. As for Mount Zion, which lies desolate, and jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, remain and reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to all generations. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us so long? Turn us to yourself, O Lord, and we shall be turned and restored. Renew our days as of old. They had to, re to admit their need. They need to confess that they had sinned and recognize that they were faint in their hearts, that their spiritual vision was dim. They had to acknowledge that God hadn't changed. God hadn't moved. God was still faithful, but they themselves had moved. They themselves had become unfaithful. They were asking the cause, why doesn't God's presence seem to be with us? We need to take inventory when we don't sense God's presence with us. Why? Is there something blocking the presence of God? But the cry was this, oh God, turn us. God, restore us. God, renew us. And that is a prayer that we should be praying today if we're but a part of a self-centered church where our focus is upon ourselves, me and mine, and that's our number one interest, for our interest needs to be the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and that the world shall know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is, as the old chorus goes. Be with us next time, and we'll deal with the subject of how and when should we repent. And when I come before the presence of the Most Holy, I shall look upon his face out through my veil For it's the blood of Jesus I'll be wearing Program copies available. Full set of 12 lessons on CDs, $34. DVDs, $44. At $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. Original Carol Brooks song album. Audio cassettes, $10 each. CDs, $14 each. At $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. For orders and support gifts, call toll-free 1-866-777-4748 or call 1-619-445-0751. For more information, please contact Carol Brook Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 1909, Alpine, California, 91903. On the World Wide Web, visit carolbrookministries.com. Email carolbrook at carolbrookministries.com. Prayer line numbers are 1-541-592-4539 or 1-619-401-9389.